Myrdal's methodology. What I'm going to do is start by looking at the context, and he has six main elements in his methodology, which I'll talk about, how far they were taken up, and what the lessons are for today, if any. So let me start with the context. Um, the Cold War was intense when he was writing, and he was very, very influenced by it. He felt it, you know, it was just part of the way people thought about things. Indian independence was, of course, relatively recent. And since independence, economic growth had been the overwhelming objective of, and industrialization of economists, visiting economists, and also local economists. Um, it's important to know the context of economics in the West, which was mainly Keynesian. Um, the economic advisors from the West emphasized, therefore, they emphasized investment. They followed the Harrodomar growth model, which he criticized. There were such people as Nerxer and Rostow and others. Um, eco economics then, and I must say now, rarely reflected on its role or the limits of its, uh, what, what underlay it or the limits of what it could say about things. It was, it was even more dominant than it is now. Now, for me, I was excited by this project because when I started <coughs> working on development, Myrdal's book was coming out. And I read it as I started looking around, as I was living in Kenya, and it was really had a huge effect on me. It really has influenced the way I've thought about things ever since. And to me, it, was, it really spoke to me. So I was excited to go back to it to see if it still speaks to me. So here I'm going to consider the six elements of the critique, what he said, how far they were taken up by others, and the relevance today of the message. So the six elements, just to tell you briefly, and I'll go through them one by one, the beam in our eyes, the political element in analysis, the question of values and the definition of development, the social system and its five ma major categories, tentatively multidisciplinarity, and the inapplicability of Western economics, which was sort of the bottom line of everything he said, what he was trying to prove. Now, of course, these six are connected. They're not really logically separate. And, I accept that, and I think Mirda would accept that, but I'm going to treat them separately. So the beam in our eyes. Basically, what he's saying is we are not impartial observers. And when I, you can see any, anything in italics on the PowerPoint, a quotes from Mirda. So personal and social conditioning influence the way we think. Every scientist is, social scientist is conditioned by the society in which they live and the political climate. A disinterested social scientist has never existed. And when talking about economists, only about the peculiar behavior of our own profession do we choose to remain naive. That incidentally applies today too. Um, the beam influences everything. It influences what we say normatively, what we say positively, what approach we use, what concepts we use, what data we collect. Now, that beam is widely recognized today by postmodern analysis. And in fact, you could say that the a lot of postmodern analysis is about the beam, but it is not by mainstream economists. It was at the time, and there's some very good papers, which uh, I, I would, I'm sure many of you have read by Dudley Sears, who was making much the same point, but instead of making it in 2,300 pages, he made it in 30 pages, and it was less taken up, but uh, there you go. Coming to the political element in analysis, for Myrdal, the Cold War was the political element. And he was, as I said, very much influenced by it. And he thought that it influenced the sort of policies people advocated. You know, we were advocating we being the West, advocating development because we want to compete against the Eastern Bloc. It justified aid. It was just informed everything. And so he was very conscious of that. Today, that Cold War approach, obviously, uh -huh. Not quite so dated as it used to be, but still seems dated. Um, and politics remain important, but they're not necessarily that politics. They remain important in a distribution. What he didn't say, and I, th I think today is what I would say, is he neglected the economic element, the economic interests underlying our analysis. He didn't say anything about how Western economic interests are served by the type of economics they give you that Western economic interests want free trade, they want um, free movement of uh, 
um, capital, but they want recognition of property rights, because otherwise they wouldn't get too much out of the technology and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of economic interests behind economics, but he didn't recognize those. He was always talking about the political element. Values and concepts. Valuations enter into the choice of approach, the selection of problems, the definition of concepts, and so on and so forth. Um, in fact, as he concludes, most writings, particularly in economics, remain in large part simply ideological. Values inform everything we do. Um, for example, in the choice of approach, do we look just at what we call the economic realm or do we look beyond? Which problems do we look at? Values determine that. Are we going to be hung up on stabilization, inflation, or are we going to look at social cohesion or individual happiness and so on? Um, the definition of concepts, that's, he spent a lot of time on that. Unemployment and employment, why do we focus on that? And in fact, I remember we went on a long time ago, a Kenya, ILO Kenya mission, in which uh, was supposedly employment, and it immediately became apparent that Western concept of employment was completely inappropriate and that one had to look at the informal sector and, it, you know, jobs, Western jobs wasn't the right way to look at it. And he had a lot of criticism of that, a lot of criticism of the concepts of investment and consumption because he says a lot of what we call consumption or what we then called consumption, in fact, contribute to future productivity and in particular health, education, but also food. So again, I think there's much more recognition now that that is the case. Although we haven't changed the definition in the national accounts, the national accounts still have these things as consumption rather than investment. But I think in terms of analytics, we do recognize that many of these items are both consumption and investment goods. Um, he argued that Western values are typically assumed without discussion and that transparency was needed. We need to make explicit the value premises applied in social study, both for logical clarity and for the avoidance of hidden valuations that lead to biases. And then he went on to say that values should be local. It's not from the point, viewpoint of the foreign observer, but from the viewpoint of those valuations that have relevance and significance in the countries. A very important point. But then whose values, it, whose values in the countries? This is where he's, in modern day terms, a little controversial because he said it should reflect actual valuations held by people who are concerned with the problems being studied and who are influential in molding public policy. In other words, the elite decision makers, and those were the people he went to for the values. And he was actually quite explicit about wanting to go to those people because he had a very um, contemptuous view of the population as a whole, who he felt were satisfied in their state of underdevelopment and would not want modern, what he called modernization values. So he just looked to the elite for the local values. So how did he arrive at them? He, he said he, he went to the politically alert, articulate and active part of the population, read their speeches and talked to them and came to a set of values, which he called modernization values. They include rationality, superstitious beliefs and illogical reasoning should be abandoned. Development, planning, equalization, changed attitudes and institutions, national consolidation, democracy. Look at those values carefully. What are they? They are Scandinavian values. So despite all the talk about the beam in his eye, and the beam came out again here, because the method of arriving at values was to talk to people who already basically agreed with the Western observer, in, the, in this case, uh, Gunnar Myrdal. Um, and so, um, although I very much accept what he says about values in terms of one ought to look at other people's values, I don't think that he did so. He, he just took his own values, really. Now, today, it's accepted in theory that people should be consulted. And um, we have, for example, a lot of participatory processes that are used. Um, we also have uh, Sen's view that you have deliberative democracy, that you have discussions and so on, and something comes out of that, which is the local values. Uh, but and the methods we use today are much more sophisticated and much more comprehensive than Myrdal. We look at, we try and take the, the values of poor as well as rich, and we don't only look at the elite. For example, Robert Chambers has obviously led the work, led the work on that, and a, and a lot of 
subsequent work has been done. Yet there are main problems. For example, at one point, obviously a decade or two ago, I was looking at these so-called PRSPs, Poverty Reduction Strategy Papers, which were drawn up after huge amounts of consultation and actually reflected IMF values when you looked at the details. Um, second, there's a problem with heterogeneity of views. You have, con there's, you have a group and some people think one thing and some people think another. The person who's doing the exercise, orchestrating it, can really inter interpret it as they want. So it's not so straightforward. And basically, there is almost no consultation on macroeconomic policy. There's lots of consultation about whether you have a school here or there, a water well here or there. Would you prefer water or schools? That's a good thing to have, good consultation. But when it comes to macro policy, which involves everything, the local opinion makers are just uh, not there. I mean, you need to read uh, Adults in the Room, which explains in the Greek, Greek case how little the Greek, Greek uh, sophisticated economists could, little contribution they could make to decisions on macroeconomic policy. And also today, local values are overridden. For example, in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan, they wanted to have some universal benefits, and IMF and World Bank insisted on targeting, and of course they won. So even though we are now accepting local values much more, there's a lot of tokenism, including, I think, in drawing up the SDGs, which are thought of as wonderful global goals, but when you think about it, it's very much a Myrdalian exercise of just talking to the elite and coming up with the goals that people have thought of already, and which are disagreed with in many places. Not every country wants gender equality, for example. I mean, there are a lot of disagreements about in the world about which values to have. All right, here's five categories. These are the five categories. Output and incomes, conditions of production, you can read them. He's a big, big, big emphasis on institutions. Our approach is mainly institutional. And he includes the nature of the state as a very important actor. And he criticized economists for neglecting these five factors and just looking at investment and growth and so on. Of course, the five are not completely separate. They, they have a lot of links, levels of living, output and incomes are very highly linked. Um, and there isn't a clear distinction between instruments and objectives. But the importance of the five things is they point to circular causation. That is that if you fail on one, you may hold back everything on the other. On the other hand, if you succeed on one or two, you might push things forward. Now, it's quite interesting here to reflect on Myrdal because Myrdal said these five are so interconnected that we're not going to get development in Asia, really. He was very pessimistic, where it's really interesting because he used very much the same methodology for his great book, An American Dilemma, in which he looked at the situation of black Americans and had very much the same views about the circular causation and this, that, and the other. But there, he thought that if you pushed forward on one, you'd get progress on the others. But in Asia, he thought the opposite. And in fact, of course, it turned out he was wrong in both cases. He was wrong in Asia, but as we've heard and we will hear further, Asia did transform. And he was wrong in the US. They still have a terrible problem. So that's very interesting to reflect on. So what about current views about the five factors? I think we generally recognize that levels of living affect productivity. The importance of institutions is, of course, absolutely central to analysis. Maybe not interpreted quite as broadly as he did, but central. It's totally agreed that the state is critical. He had this concept of soft state and hard state, and only hard states could really get policy change. And many have, people have worked on that. And I think we generally agree about circular causation. Um, you, if you go forward on one front, you, you need to go forward on several fronts simultaneously to be successful. Um, what happened, and I've already said that he was over-pessimistic for Asia, I think following... What happened, I think, is much more reflects what Hirschman found. I don't know if you, uh, you remember that he wrote this book about the hiding hand and that in the end of the day, even bad projects turn into good projects. And here he's saying that there's a long list of prerequisites for development, and you'd think you'd never get any development, but in the end you do get development, because in some mysterious way, you don't really have to have that long list of prerequisites. As long as you go forward in some ways, other things catch up. 
So I think, in a way, Asia followed Hirschman more. Incidentally, of course, Hirschman was talking about Latin America, which probably followed Myrdal more. So it was a sort of paradox. He talked about the need for multidisciplinarity. So if we are correct about the five factors, then we need more interdisciplinary research. And we should welcome efforts by sociologists and others to improve our system of theories and concepts. But he did see that there were some problems in multidisciplinary work, which I think we all recognize they remain problems. And he did argue that economics should remain in the lead. He felt that the economists were more political and more dynamic than other disciplines. Um, so he didn't abandon the imperialism of economics. And his own team was almost entirely consisting of economists. I would say today we totally recognize the need for interdisciplinarity, but it remains true that I think economics remains king, and we do have problems about interdisciplinarity. The inappropriateness, the sixth point, the inappropriateness of Western concepts. Um, because <coughs> they're inappropriate because they re reflect the value and motivation of Western economists, and they abstract, and this is very important. Francis, it's 15 minutes now. Okay, so I better yeah. speed up. They abstract from attitudes and institutions because they assume they're the same as the West. And I gave the examples earlier. And others made very similar points, and some of them well before him. I mean, Joan Robinson in 1960 said exactly the same point. Dudley Sears made the same point. And I really want to point to Mukherjee, because Indian economist, sociologist and economist, and he made exactly the same point before Middle. So is this accepted? It's accepted with respect to particular concepts, but not in general. In general, development economics, which at then, that point was rather different from the rest, has sort of suffered a death, and uh, we've got much more um, feeling that there's just one economics. I think heterodox e economists, like myself and many people in this room, are more prepared to accept this point, but orthodox economists don't. Um, Another point that he, he didn't really pick up with the respect to Asian drama is, of course, that the concepts are often inappropriate for the West, too. It's not just for developing countries, but it's also for the West. He had made that point at some point earlier, but in, in Asian drama, he didn't. And I think that was because Keynesian economics was so dominant then, and that did seem relevant. So, in sum, the ideas that are now broadly accepted, that development is a normative project, that local people should decide on priorities, that development is holistic and interconnected, that context <laughs> matters, that we need an interdisciplinary approach. None of these entirely due to Myrdal. Others have made similar points and little dialogue, but they are all very important points, and they're all accepted, I think, by many in theory, not always in practice. The ideas that are probably not accepted or certainly not uh, adopted beam in our eyes. Very few economists um, recognize the sort of beam in their eyes and explain where they come from when they write a paper. Uh, the underdevelopment trap turned out not to be right in the Asian case. Let me move on to where we need to go beyond Myrdal. I think this is my final slide. We need to work on the practice of multidisciplinarity. We need to identify local values in a more sophisticated way. And we need to recognize the contribution of local scientists. I was really shocked writing this paper. I began getting into early Indian economists, not early, but early 20th century ones. They'd made all these points, and they were not even referred to in Asian drama. And in a book which is talking about the importance of local values, I, I, was, I found it totally shocking. Um, and even word for word, the importance of institutions and so forth, the, the uh, irrelevance of Western concepts, it was, you know, and even the five elements, you know, the interconnectedness, they were all there. Um, I think we need to question the appropriateness of concepts in every context, not just in the South, but it's in the North too. And of course, there's been a convergence of problems of North and South. Thank you. Thank you.